On behalf of the director of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Rick Harney, and the entire staff of the USAHEC and the U.S. Army War College, welcome to the fourth lecture in the 47th Annual Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. The Army Heritage and Education Center and the U.S. Army War College sponsor the Perspectives Series to provide a historical dimension to the exercise of generalship, strategic leadership, and the warfighting institutions of land power. In addition, we would like to extend a warm thank you to the Army Heritage Center Foundation for all of their support and everything we do here at the AHEC. Please be aware that the book for tonight is on sale in the gift shop and right out the back doors here and we'll have a book signing after the lecture. All proceeds from the book sale and the gift shop go to the foundation and support the growth of the Army Heritage and Education Center. Our speaker tonight is Mr. Peter Van Buren. Mr. Van Buren hails from New York City and is a former United States Foreign Service employee, as well as a 24-year veteran of the United States State Department. With the State Department, he spent a year in Iraq as the lead for, a two, for two State Department provincial reconstruction teams in rural Iraq. Following his retirement, Mr. Van Buren has commented on U.S. foreign policy and has been featured in such publications as Salon, The Huffington Post, The Nation, Mother Jones, The Guardian, The BBC, Al Jazeera, and The New York Times, to just name a few. Mr. Van Buren's most no notable publications includes Ghosts of Tom Joad, the story of the hashtag 99%, and we meant well how I helped lose the battle for the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, Mr. Peter Van Buren. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for all coming out on a chilly night. Uh, I hope to make this uh, entertaining for you. You know, this is the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. It was uh, on this day that Abraham Lincoln uh, made his uh, presentation. I don't promise to be anywhere as short as he was um, or as articulate, um, but the good news is you do get to ask questions at the end. So we uh, hope that this uh, will clearly be not remembered uh, as uh, Lincoln thought his speech was going to be. All that said, I want to uh, apologize uh, because um, apparently there's a new book out uh, by General Bolger where he takes credit for losing the, uh, the war. Um, I just want to point out that actually I was the first one to uh, claim credit for losing the war. The subtitle of my book is How I Helped Lose the Battle for the Hearts and Minds of the Iraqi People. So with all apologies to General Bolger, uh, I was kind of there first. Um, I'm going to speak with you today about well, how I did in fact lose that, that battle. Um, a little bit about what happened to me when I wrote the book that I did explaining what happened to me in Iraq, and then at the end, see if we could draw a few lessons from Iraq 2.0, the war that uh, I participated in, and see if any of those things might apply to the current uh, struggle we'll call Iraq 3.0, and see where things go there. But it actually all begins many, many years ago when I was a foreign service officer. My expertise was in Asia, I had served with the State Department for quite some time there. I was in Japan, I was in Korea, I was in all the different Chinas, spoke some of those languages, and so I was exactly the perfect candidate to go to Iraq, at least as far as the State Department was concerned, and that was because as the war went on, the State Department quickly burned through the people who, who thought they knew what they were doing, the people who were Arabists, who had spent their whole career in the Middle East, who spoke Arabic, and who knew something about the job we were being given to do, reconstruction, rebuilding Iraq. We were going to actually go out and win the war. These slides, by the way, are all pictures that I took uh, during my time in Iraq. That's the uh, embassy lacrosse team in Baghdad playing on the giant green lawn at the embassy. And we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, the slides are not directly tied to, to what I'm saying, but are there mainly so you don't have to look at me the whole time through. Um, so the State Department burned through all of its experts fairly early on, the people who knew about the Middle East, the people who spoke Arabic. We then went through a tranche of folks who were kind of uh, adventure junkies. Instead of being 
overweight, balding civil servants behind desks. They wanted to be overweight, balding civil servants sitting in Humvees. The third tranche was the people who were voluntold, who were said, who were plucked out uh, by the Secretary of State, uh, Condoleezza Rice at, at that time, um, and then uh, her uh, successor, Hillary Clinton, your next president, and uh, we're told, you're going to Iraq. Now, Reconstruction, I knew only about the stuff. I read those pamphlets at Home Depot that would tell you how to change a, a plunger or ch fix the toilet, um, and I knew nothing about uh, the Middle East, so I was going to get trained. Now, I see a lot, of, a lot of folks here who appear to have uh, done some military service or maybe active duty. Can I just see a show of hands, those who are veterans or currently on active duty? Mostly. So you know a little bit about training. So preparing me to go to Iraq took actually three full weeks. Um, the first week was a course that, that we called Islam for Dummies. And it was run by a, a, a contractor, I'm sorry, that's a four-letter word sometimes, it was run by a contractor who looked and actually sounded like Dr. Phil. And so he would give us all this advice about Iraq. He said, now remember, over there, dudes kiss. And so you don't serve bacon because they don't like pigs. And, you know, other than that, everything is going to be just pretty much the way it is here. And it was very reassuring because he had that nice, nice voice. The second week was uh, we went out to an undisclosed location in, in West Virginia, which is undisclosed because I can't remember exactly where, where it was. And... Uh, all these guys who had all these tattoos and NYPD ball caps and stuff were going to teach us how to shoot guns. And I didn't even know enough to, 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 that I wasn't supposed to call them guns at, at that point in time. But these guys knew, and so they would take us out there. I'm sorry, ma'am, may I borrow you, your hands for a moment, just if that's okay? You're going to be me. And so these guys would take a, 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 a pistol, and they'd put it in our hand, and then they'd wrap their hands around my hand, and they said, okay, point over that way. All right, pull the trigger. Go, great shot, good. And next, please. And that was the training we got on, on guns. They also taught us to drive cars real fast, and I never drove a, a car in Iraq, and I never, never carried a weapon. The last week was, and I, these, these are little signs. You know how, like, you're on a, we may be a, a group that's of a certain age, but, I mean, remember back when you went, started to go on dates, and the, you know, the signs were there early in the evening that this was just not going well. Um, you know, she's looking at her phone, she's starting to flirt with the waiter, you know, there's just little tips that think, and so in between Dr. Phil and the tattooed guys with the NYPD ball caps, um, the third week was how we were going to keep track of what turned out to be $63 billion in reconstruction funds. And that was an Excel spreadsheet which we would email around the, uh, the theater, I guess you'd call it, um, and keep track of, of all this money. So, with all that set, I was put on a, a, an airplane. I got to the uh, airport in, in Washington, D.C., and uh, the, the woman at the counter, because I, I didn't know, nobody told us what to bring. You know, soldiers, you get told exactly what to bring, right? You gotta bring your, your mob gear and, and, and your cold weather gear to Iraq and all this. You know, nobody told me. We had these checklists that were passed around the State Department like bureaucratic chlamydia, you know, telling us what to do. I remember going to the Army, Army surplus store and, and saying to the, to the guy, um, I don't know what kind of shoes to do. He said, you don't want shoes, you want boots. Um, and he, he gave me boots. He to sold me boots. Anyway, they put me on a plane. The woman at the counter said, said uh, you don't have to pay for all your checked baggage because you're a soldier. And I, mean, I really didn't know what to say to her. I didn't want to pay for the baggage, so I just smiled. I get on the plane, I fly across the ocean there, we, get, we land in Kuwait, it's the middle of the night. I don't know, it, you know it's just crazy. I'm, the people are pulling me and pushing me. There's all these KBR uh, contractors there, and they were all gentlemen of a certain girth. Um, and, you know, we're in the airport in Kuwait, and there's all these uh, Kuwaiti guys that are kind of like flowing like ghosts through the airport with the, the white uh, things. And then there's this large man who's saying, you, come on over. So we went through this. We drove through the desert. We, I get on a, a C-130 for the first time in my life. We fly there. We land. Some guy says, it's Baghdad, sir. You got to get out. And we get out, and then I, get to, I go to the embassy, and I'm at the embassy all of six hours before I'm sent out to win this war. 
And so at the embassy, they have some poor National Guard guy who's supposed to give me a helmet and body armor. And he says, so which, uh, which dorm are you going to be staying at here at the embassy? And I said, well, it's not a dorm. It's a, I'm going to a FOB, because I didn't know it was supposed to be called FOB. And he said, oh, well, you don't need this one, sir. You need this one. And so he puts about 300 pounds of body armor on me. I fly on a helicopter the very first time. We land out in the middle of nowhere in the desert. Everything's happening at night, so I don't have a clue. And uh, they rush me right from the helicopter pad into the colonel's office. This is a whole brigade, what, 3,000 men and women, which I am the lone State Department person to. So I have there, there, those of you who pay your taxes, <laughs> I'm as good as 3,000 other guys. So there you go. <laughs> you got your money's worth. I, they rush me right from the helicopter pad. I must be like 3 o'clock in the, in the, I was going to say, Three o'clock in the morning, they rush me into the colonel, and I, 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 so I did what they do in the movies, and I said, Colonel, I'm here from the U.S. Department of State to assist you in the reconstruction of Iraq. And he says, okay, that's good. Um, what's your plan? And I said, um, no one told me the plan, sir. He says, all right, well, I was sort of hoping you knew. Now we're, now we're in trouble. The very first thing that I was sent out to do was to meet my, my team, which was actually at another location. This colonel was smarter than you think because he took all of these boneheads who were there uh, supposedly to do this and he put them way out at a remote location. I, you know, I'm learning, I'm picking this up. And uh, I went out there and the very first thing is they said, well, we're, gonna, we're saving uh, people here in this area. For those of you who are familiar with Iraq, this was... Uh, uh, a desolate area about halfway between Baghdad and the Iranian border. It was a delightful uh, vacation spot called Fob Hammer. Um, don't, don't go there. Um, and so I was sent out to meet uh, my team, and, they, and I said, what are we working on? And they said, well, we're, we're giving sheep to widows. I said, well, how is this? What is this? We're giving sheep to widows. And they said, yes, this is how we're going to win the war because we're supposed to get, collect, uh, you know, make people's hearts and minds that, you know, that thing. And so we're going to give sheep to widows, and then everyone's going to like us out here. Okay. I mean, I'm kind of going with it here. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know anything about this. Uh, who are these widows? Well, they're all the relatives of the sheikh who controls this part of, of Iraq. Okay. So they're his relatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're all widows. It, they, he, you know, I didn't know. Oh, he told us. Okay. So do these women know anything about raising sheep? No. He's going to teach them. I see. How much did we pay for these sheep? And they told me some crazy amount, I mean, like, what, like what a Toyota would cost. And I said, you know, that just seems like a lot for a sheep. And they said, well, don't worry about it because this is how we do things here. We buy stuff, we give them to Iraqis who are nice to us, parentheses, aren't actively killing us as we can tell. And then that's a hearts and minds mission completed on to the next one. And I was a little bit surprised to, to learn this is what the strategy was until I talked to the colonel and the colonel said, yes, this is exactly what we have been doing here. And then he told me, by the way, he's so happy to see that I appeared to be somewhat normal because he actually threw the last State Department guy out. Um, and the one before that went out on a psychological uh, withdrawal. And the one before that, no, no offense, was a reservist who thought that because he was a reservist that he got to bring his rank uh, onto the, uh, the forward operating base and the colonel was less than impressed that there was a reservist colonel um, there challenging his authority. Just to kind of hint where this is all going, um, I found as a professional diplomat that I spent most of my diplomacy inside the wire not outside the wire, because the State Department had equipped me with absolutely nothing. We were the lead federal agency at this point in time. We were the ones who had inherited the job of winning the war. You remember, after the invasion of 2003, when the Iraqis, who obviously didn't get the memo, did not greet us as liberators, did not shower us with, with chocolates. I guess they don't really do wine, bottles of wine. They did not send their spunky French daughters out to climb onto our Sherman tanks as we rolled through liberating them. Um, the first person that was supposed to win the war, our uh, person L. Paul Bremer, who was the uh, so-called pro-counsel, um, his 
gift to the thing was to immediately disband the Iraqi army, the Iraqi civil service, and throw hundreds of thousands of armed, trained soldiers out of their jobs, cut off their paychecks, destroy civil society, so that there was nobody teaching school, nobody running the water plants. So that turned out to be less successful than we had originally anticipated. Um, the next step was that we were going to hire contractors, and we did. We hired uh, people like uh, KBR, Dynam Dynacore, and a whole bunch of other thugs and thieves whose, whose names, gratefully, I can't remember, it would trigger my own PS PTSD. And we gave them extraordinary amounts of money, of which they took most of it for themselves. They spent most of the rest of it on security for themselves. And then they did not go forward and repair the electrical grid or the water systems or the sewer systems or any of those things we had asked them to do. And they, did, they didn't do this primarily because actually completing a contract turned out to be financially a really bad move for them. And so actually keeping the war kind of flowing was, was their thing. So they got out of it. The Army Corps of Engineers got a chance at all this, and they turned out to be not nation builders either. By the way, that's the boots on the ground that uh, you hear so much about. That's the actual one. Um, and the Army Corps of Engineers didn't do it. And so somehow, by 2009, when I went to Iraq, it was me. I was going to win this war. But as we go back to the Colonel and I, we, I didn't have any resources. The State Department gave me some contractors. My agricultural expert was a pig farmer from Missouri. Um, he knew more about animals, I guess, than, than I did. Um, but surprisingly, what he thought was hilarious, which was to constantly introduce himself as a pig farmer, um, was not as well received by the Iraqi farmers that we were interacting with. Who knew, right? Um, I had a, a woman who taught girls gym at a small college. She was our women's empowerment advisor. Um, there was a guy who worked in New Hampshire as a city manager. He was going to do the democracy creation uh, thing in Iraq. Um, I had a, hum, uh, a Bradley driver who was my water expert. He knew nothing about water. I hope he was a much better Bradley driver than he was a water expert, I can only assume. Um, and I had this whole collection of people. It was like the Isle of Misfit Toys. Um, none of these people saw me as, as an authority figure. In fact, they saw me as a huge pain in their backside because what they really wanted to do was simply spend money. And they spent money the same reason kids draw pictures for you to put on the refrigerator. They like to have you say, you've done a nice job. And it turns out that the only thing you needed to do to make the embassy very happy was to spend money. The only metric the State Department had given me was to spend money. The more money we spent, the better we were. The better we were doing, the more our hearts and or minds we were actually winning. There was a direct... And it turns out that the Army had given their people exactly the same mission. And so finally, the interagency process worked. The Army and the State Department were given exactly the same thing. Spend as much money as possible, and we will reward you for spending all that money. More rewards, more money. It was, it was kind of in cycle. And so the Colonel and I were actually in lockstep with one another. We only differed on what we should spend it on. But the good news was everybody had enough money to spend on what they wanted to spend on. So the colonel had been, his, his kind of attention, you know, it's like when you're shopping online, his kind of attention got caught by the idea that we were going to make medical alcohol out of dates. Iraqis grew dates. Well, actually, they weren't growing any dates because the dates, uh, apparently they'd been growing dates for such a long time, there were these highly evolved date-eating beetles that were kept in check only by Saddam paying for sprayers to come out every year and spray the dates. Unfortunately, when we disposed of Saddam, spray for date beetles was way down the to-do list. Um, right after, you know, defeat Al-Qaeda, you know, defeat Al-Qaeda, world communism, da, 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 spray for date beetles. So we didn't get that far down the list. We did spray for dates. The trees didn't bear fruit. It was a, but we were going to make medical alcohol out of them. Meanwhile, my team was saying, you know, the embassy sent us a, a memo. We've got it. This is the week we have to empower women this week. And so, so, we had to, so they were going to be working on that. I was told that I had to have a project of my own. And I really couldn't think of, of anything. Uh, but they said, well, we'll, get, we'll give you one. So we all fanned out to spend money. 
And we did. We were very successful because, you know, the Iraqis had gotten it. They weren't sure about George Bush. They weren't entirely sure about this whole invasion thing. They had their own thoughts about the Iranians, the Kurds, but they understood that the Americans had gone completely insane, had come across the other side of the world simply to hand them money for no apparent reason. And so they were in lockstep with the colonel and I as well. And so these people would come out of the woods, literally, helping us spend our money. One of the th women's empowerment was a big problem because most of the women in our rural area had no interest in being empowered. They, for better or worse, were very happy wearing their, their, their hijab, their, their, their whole head-to-toe covering. They were very happy locking themselves into rooms while the men talked. They, that's how they lived. They were not interested in wearing miniskirts and listening to Taylor Swift, which I guess was as close as we could come to this concept of empowerment. So we didn't know what to do with this, but it turned out that the embassy had also told us and the army that we were supposed to help widows. Remember the sheep for widows? And widows were women. So it was like a twofer. You could help <laughs> widows and check off the box on women all in one thing. So I got the, the Bees for Widows project. This was my contribution. Um, I spent, I think it was like, like $60,000 to give bees to widows so that they would raise these bees, make honey, and then I'm not sure, you know, I, I, was, I only had a year there, so I was just going to take it as far as the making honey part. Um, and then you're left with this problem of how to get enough widows to chew up $50,000 worth of bees. Now, widows, there are a lot of widows in Iraq. I mean, we created some ourselves. Um, but you can't just kind of like go out to, uh, you know, the local TGI Fridays and see who looks desperate at the bar. You had to... <laughs> and so out of the woods came... A widow broker. This was an Iraqi woman who said she could produce as many widows as we would need. Just tell her how many. And she would fax over to us these wonderful, these Iraqi ID cards, these dour pictures of these very serious looking women who were going to raise bees. And this all worked well until the embassy said, well, you've got to get some pictures of all this because nothing happens unless we have pictures we can send back to Washington. So I asked to see the widows and their bees, and it turns out that all of the widows were like really busy that week and uh, were not available. This went on and on and on. Over the course of the time I was there, we taught women how to bake pastries in hopes that they would open uh, pastry shops on streets that had no water or electricity. We put on plays. We created one internet thing after another because internet was kind of a cool thing um, where we would pay for a whole year's worth of something without any thought to what was going to happen after that. It turned out that we were paying people so much money to pick up garbage, Iraqi people to pick up garbage, that, the, that there were doctors, Iraqi doctors, who were stopping practicing medicine because they could make more money picking up garbage at the rates we were paying. Municipal, municipalities that we were trying to empower were, were giving up trying to acquire budgets out of Baghdad because we were paying for everything. And it seemed as if nothing was being accomplished and in many ways we were doing a lot of harm. I found out that we had driven the price of veterinary medicines up so high in our area by buying this stuff at crazy prices that regular farmers could not afford to immunize their animals. The only way they could get the veterinary medicine would be if we gave it to them. because we could. Only, and then when I said, stop it, we're going to stop buying this stuff. Well, they kept the price as high as it was. This picture is a timely little thing. You see that statue there? It's a giant American eagle that's perched on a mountain. We paid for that. One of the things that we did was to run an art show in a place called Dora. Dora was, at that time, still a community that had Sunnis and Shias and some Christians living in it. Um, and we put on an art show in order to promote whatever we were doing. Um, Dora today, of course, uh, is a Shia area. They've ethnically cleansed everybody else uh, from there. 
we did all these things, and I realized we were doing more harm than good, and I said, this is ridiculous, I'm not going to do it anymore, and I stopped signing things. This caused me to get called to the embassy, where I was, we, we, when I was like, growing up in Ohio, we called it a come to Jesus meeting, where you'd go to the tent and the preacher would try to convince you it was time to, to give up your, uh, your soul to, to Christ. And this was roughly what happened here in the sense that someone stood in front of me and harangued me for about 20 minutes basically saying, you need to spend more money. You may have reservations. You may think this is not making any sense. I'm not picking on you, sir. Um, you know, um, but this is our job. And I said, but it's, it's wrong. It's fraudulent. It's not a conflict. And they said, this is policy. What is your problem? So I kind of sort of maybe gave up at that point and just figured I'm going to get through my year um, and uh, put this all behind me, go back home to my family and all that other good stuff. And I, d I got angry and I thought, well, maybe somebody should know more about this. Maybe people didn't really know. My boss knew because it was his job to yell at me to spend money. The army bosses knew because it was the general's job to yell at the colonel who yelled at the lieutenant colonel who yelled at the major who told the captain to go out and buy the Iraqis some gosh darn sheep, bees, chickens, whatever we were doing at that time. Um, and so I tried to get an appointment with the ambassador and you know he was busy. And then I tried to get an appointment with the, the vice ambassador, the deputy chief of mission it's called. Um, and, and he was pretty busy. I got to see my, my own boss again and he told me, go home, shut up, you're done. Um, I tried to get an appointment with the special inspector general for Iraqi reconstruction, Seeger. And they said, look, unless you've got like photographic evidence of guys stuffing $100 bills into gym bags and getting on planes, we're kind of busy. Um, I got an appointment with the Army historian, um, but it turns out that all he was really interested in was me discussing my relationship with the, uh, the military and how that all worked, um, which was fascinating stuff, but I mean, he really wasn't. So I went back to Washington. I called up the people at the State Department who do the Iraq things. And I started to explain, and they said, excuse me, excuse me, let me just cut you off here. You know, if you're having mental health issues, you really should call medical. They'll, they'll help you get rid of some of this anger. So that went nowhere. I tried to talk to the State Department Inspector General. They basically said, again, this is policy. What is your problem with, with all this? And there was nobody who wanted to hear anything about this. I, I don't know why I didn't think about talking to a like newspaper reporter or anything like that, but I didn't. What I decided I wanted to do was to write it all down. And I had kept a lot of notes, both for work purposes, and I had started to write these long emails back to my wife uh, every night when we come in from the field, you know, which always started with, you can't believe what happened today. And then I would explain about the chicken processing plant that didn't process chicken, the milk processing plant that the tank had holes in it I could put my finger in, the pastry making classes that got disrupted by mortar fire, the uh, women's sewing uh, collective that turned out to be slave labor and the people there were kept as virtual uh, indentured servants, the rug making business where they had children weaving rugs which were then sold at the embassy bazaar. Um, there were many of these emails and I decided I'm going to put, write them all down and I thought I should make a book out of this. It never occurred to me that anyone would be less than enthusiastic to, to, to receive this information from me. So everything went to, you know, books take a really long time to, to, to write. I mean, not just the, the typing part, but the publishing part and everything else like that. And I was lucky enough that, that a publisher said, yeah, this, is, this sounds kind of amusing. We'll, uh, we'll do this. Um, the time kind of goes on. My boss at the State Department, I mean, the State Department put me in, in they, they thought I did okay, I guess. They put me in this, the office that does the uh, uh, evaluation about who's going to be a foreign service officer next. It's you know, kind of an important thing. Um, so I'm just sitting there doing my thing. My boss was a frustrated novelist, and so he was always asking me questions about publishing. He knew, you know, everybody knew what I was doing. And then nobody said anything. I, I sent this, the book text through the State Department's vetting system. Um, because I had no interest in disclosing classified material. I didn't really have anything classified to disclose. Um, and I went through and it got vetted. Um, who knows what happened to that person's job. But, but um, 
anyway, I'm, I'm sure uh, Walmart always needs another greeter. But, um, and everything was, was fine until uh, the publisher said, you know, you should start a blog. I said, what's a blog? And they said, well, look it up, ask your kids, and then start a blog. And so I started a blog, and I would just write about whatever kind of come across my mind. And uh, this was when the whole WikiLeaks thing was starting to come out and everything. And so uh, about a month before the book was uh, going to hit the, uh, the bookstores, I get called into security, State Department's uh, internal security people. And they said, I heard you got a book coming out. I said, yeah, yeah. My boss knew about it, got vetted and everything. And they said, well, you're in trouble, and uh, bad things are about to happen to you. Take a deep breath. Okay, okay. And they said, all right, well, we're going to fire you because uh, on your website you, le you linked to a WikiLeaks document. I said, well, what's that mean? They said, well, you linked, you know, those things on the Internet where you click on it and it takes you to someplace else. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, that counts as disclosure of classified information. Um, and we're going to fire you, and your case is being referred to the Department of Justice uh, for possible prosecution under the Espionage Act. Have a nice day. Um, and they took away my security clearance, which I had held without incident uh, for, for 24 years, well, 23 years at that time. Um, never had a, a, an issue. They took it away, and it was because of this book. About a week before the book came out, the State Department sent a letter to the publisher claiming that there were three instances of classified information that had been revealed in the book. Now, this is, of course, after they vetted the, the book, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the publisher assigned an intern to locate those three pieces of information on the Internet. Um, and you know how Google, up in the corner, it tells you your search took point zero 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 two point five seconds? She, uh, the intern recorded how many point zero 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 two five seconds it took her to find the three pieces of classified information. One of them was that the CIA had been in Somalia. The source of which was the movie Black Hawk Down, which is actually a great movie. Um, and the publisher said, the State Department said, you got to pull this book uh, out of, off the shelves. So the publisher smiled and said, no, 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 we're in New York. We got lots of lawyers. You know, you want to fight about this? Please. And so the State Department backed down off that, and they went back after me. And they said, well, we don't know what we're going to do with you, and we're going to try to fire you, so for the time being, uh, you don't have any job to do anymore. Just sit at your desk. Don't touch anything. Don't talk to anybody. Just sit there. Okay, I mean, this is like a dream for me, right? I, mean, I don't have to do any work. Um, except it turned into a nightmare fairly quickly. Um, and then I wrote a blog post about uh, my then boss, uh, Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State. And I said something along the... At that time, uh, if you remember, we, had in, we, had, we were in the process of liberating Libya. And uh, Gaddafi had been killed. His uh, murder, his killing had been shown on, on TV. Um, in the process of killing him, he was also he was sodomized with a knife and that video had been displayed, and the Secretary of State, America's senior diplomat, your next president, giggled about that on TV. There was an interview she was doing with Diane Sawyer, and uh, when she thought the cameras were not rolling, she laughed about it, and she said, we came, we saw, he died. Now, I thought that was inappropriate for America's top diplomat to say. Um, regardless of Gaddafi, who was certainly not a nice guy, and nobody's concerned that he's particularly dead, the idea of giggling about it and making a joke about it seemed inappropriate to me, and I said something along those lines on my blog. And at that point, the State Department dropped the entire building on me. I was told that unless I stopped talking about the book, promoting it, um, and closed down the blog, stopped tweeting, basically just shut the heck up, um, I was going to be put on the Secretary of State's uh, be on the lookout watch list as a threat to her. And because she's also guarded by the Secret Service, I was going to be put on their list. Um, and I was going to be physically removed from the building. I might have said something using a bad four-letter word to the security person who was explaining this to me. Um, and it all happened. I was given a, an order that I was not to go within 100 yards of the White House. And I was frog-marched out of the building. Uh, by a security officer, 
and they really pulled the thing off my thing. We carry the little lanyard. They really did it, just like in a movie. They snatched it right off my neck. And I was told, go home till we can figure out exactly how to fire you. So I went home. Um, about this time, it occurred to me that maybe I should call a lawyer or something. Um, I was a little, little naive. Um, and uh, I just went home, and I didn't know what to do. And while I was trying to figure out about lawyer, um, they started coming around the neighborhood. There were black cars in the neighborhood, and they were knocking on the neighbor's doors and saying, um, this guy, Peter Van Buren, he lives next door. You ever smell marijuana at his house? You ever see women who are not his spouse coming in and out at night? Any men coming in and out at night? I was called into a meeting where my whole finance, this is way before Ed, Edward Snowden stuff. I mean, my whole financial stuff was laid out, and they said, well, how do you have all this money? Which, you know, I'm on a government set, it wasn't that much. I said, well, you know, I, I'm a good saver. And they said, no, you've, you're getting this money from somewhere. The whole thing sort of fell on me in this terrible, terrible way. Um, it was personally very difficult. As you can imagine, this did not create warm marital relationships. Um, and I spent the days on the couch watching SpongeBob with, you know, my good friend, Mr. Vodka. I was very lucky that two good lawyers appeared in my life at that point in time. Both of them are now on Edward Snowden's defense team. Um, the joke is they practiced on me and now, you know, they move on to the big leagues. But uh, one of them worked for a thing called the Government Accountability Project. The other person worked for the American Civil Liberties Union. And they approached the State Department and said, this is a First Amendment case. Just because someone works for the government does not take away their right to tell a story, particularly a story that is of interest to the American people who might be wondering what happened to their $63 billion in Iraq and might be wondering why Americans are still dying in Iraq after we have had so many victories along the way. And through that process, I was able to retire from the State Department. They were trying to take away my pension. Um, I was willing to retire at that point. I mean, Lord knows I wanted nothing more to do with them. Um, but they were trying to take away my pension. There's a codicil saying if you're fired for national security reasons, um, Secretary of State can, can somehow negate your pension. Anyway. Um, I retired, and uh, you know, all is well, happy ending there. But I've not stopped thinking about Iraq and studying Iraq and reading what's going on, and I want to tie together all those funny stories I, I told you. And there's a lot more of them. The book is, is actually quite, quite funny. I, I've read it. It's not bad. Um, <laughs> and tie that together with what's going on right now in Iraq and leave you wondering if what's going on right now is going to end any different than what happened before. When I was in Iraq um, and throughout the, the nine years of that war, there were two basic pillars to America's uh, plans. One was that we were going to create an Iraqi government that was unified, pulled together the three disparate groups, the Sunnis, the Shias, and the Kurds, um, into a unified by government that was going to treat most Iraqis equally. That was the first pillar. And the second was that we were going to break the connection between the Sunni tribes and Al-Qaeda. If you recall, Al-Qaeda had come into Iraq. They weren't there before we invaded. They had come into Iraq and had melded with the, the Sunni tribes. The rebuilding of the government part was primarily the State Department. They were often running, shuffling people in and out of the Iraqi government like it was some kind of fantasy football team. You know, this, oh, this minister isn't doing real well for me this week, so we'll get another guy from over here and, you know, trade with the, the Broncos for, for a defensive back. Um, and so they say the, the part about separating Al-Qaeda from the Sunnis, of course, was David Petraeus's very famous uh, Anbar Awakening, the Sawa program, the Sons of Iraq. And the theory was that if that the Sunnis and Al-Qaeda really didn't want each other, the indigenous Sunnis were allying with Al-Qaeda simply because they needed muscle to protect them against the Shias, who had taken over the government uh, of Iraq largely through uh, American uh, assistance. So the Iranians certainly got involved in that as well. 
So the idea would be that if the Sunnis could be convinced that the Shia government was going to give them an even shake, their need for al-Qaeda was going to go away. Made some sense. Um, at the same time, we were going to do all this reconstruction stuff for everybody, and that was my little piece of it. I also had a piece of this awakening stuff, because the areas that I worked um, out west, or out east, I should say, had a lot of Sunnis and Shias at that time. And the second place I worked was actually in the so-called Sunni Triangle of Death. Um, we were told we couldn't call it that anymore, um, but we liked it anyway. Um, and there were still a lot of Sunnis, and whenever we would go out and talk to these people, and this is 2009, so people who say, oh, this all happened after we withdrew, no. 2009, we were hearing the same thing. Look, we're, the Sunnis were saying, we're not getting jobs. We're not getting the things we were promised. We're not getting paid every month unless you guys come out with the Shias and make them pay us. And even then, they shake us down after you leave. We're not getting our part of the deal, and it's getting harder and harder for us to keep the promise we made, which was to break with al-Qaeda and stop shooting at people. I had a wonderful afternoon with this delightful Sunni tribal uh, leader, who I guess is a polite way of calling him a warlord thug. I mean, this is a guy that makes Tony Soprano look like a nice guy. And he was very clear. I, he says, I control about 140 uh, killers. And up until David Petraeus and his people came, I was killing Americans, and my guys were killing Americans. You, you drove past them on your way in. They were, they were at the checkpoints waving nicely at you. And we were told that you were going to pay us money every month to become uh, guardians or watchmen or traffic cops or whatever you want to call it. And we were going to get jobs, and I was going to see some of the, my Sunni brothers get into government and be in a position to protect us there. And uh, sorry, Mr. Van Buren, none of that's really happened. Now, I'm not going to kill you today, of course, because you're a guest in my home, and uh, you know, I want you to take this back to the embassy and explain to them it's not working. We were hearing that from 2009. We were hearing it, it through the entire time I was there. It wasn't working. It wasn't working while we were there watching it not work. So those two pillars, both of which failed miserably, are the same things that the United States now has said are the bedrock of our current policy to win the war in Iraq. All you have to do is change the dates, cross out Al-Qaeda, and write in ISIS, and it all still makes sense. Unity government. Let's just take a quick spin through this. Um, Prime Minister Maliki was pushed into power in 2006 through the United States efforts. He's, he was allowed to win the 2010 uh, election, and I was there, saw it happen, um, largely through American support with some good help from our, our colleagues in Iran who supported him strongly, and he used the interior ministry to persecute, prosecute, and execute as many Sunnis as he could get away with. If you recall, two days after he left the White House, he came to the, the White House for a celebratory uh, handshake thing with Barack Obama, his first official act two days later was to try to put his Sunni vice president under arrest. When the Sunni vice president fled the country, he had a death warrant issued against him, and the guy is still in, in hiding someplace. Oh, thank you, sir, for coming tonight. I appreciate it. And Maliki stayed in power until August. Somehow we never noticed these things, I guess. Um, then we replaced him with the new guy. Remember the thing about getting, you know, trading for the defensive tackle for the Broncos? We put a new guy in, Mr. Abadi. And guess what? Abadi is from the same faction of the same political party that Maliki is from. Better yet, Maliki is still in the government. He's a vice president. Oops. In addition, Prime Minister Abadi puts a politician allied with the Badr militia into the key position of interior minister. Now let's parse that out. The Badr militia are a Shia militia strongly supported by the Iranians who were responsible, A, for killing lots and lots of Americans, and B, were primarily devoted to the death squads which took the lives of God knows how many Sunnis. That group now has their guy running the interior ministry which controls the police, the courts, the prisons, and all sorts of other nasty stuff. So as far as unity government is concerned, that is not the way to bet. We go back to the idea now that we're going to try to split the Sunnis from 
ISIS. Now you understand that the that ISIS swims in the water of the Sunnis, right? They they don't. They, 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 it's hard to simply show up in a country and try to take things over. I know we tried for nine years; it didn't work without the support of the people. Well, ISIS enjoys the support of, of many Sunnis. They control 80 percent of Anbar province, which is in western Iraq. Um, they control 80 percent of that, largely because the Sunnis know that without some muscle, the Shias are going to walk all over them again, as they have been doing. So what is America's policy going to do to split them apart? Well, the first thing we're doing is we're trying to play the same game on them. The same con that didn't work in the Anbar Awakening, we're now trying to play that con one more time on them. You know, if, 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 if they're really that stupid, well, good for us, but I don't think they are. The other thing we're doing is we're so desperate for some Iraqi entity to take the fight to ISIS. And you'll recall that we did spend $25 billion training the Iraqi army, um, primarily to throw their weapons on the ground faster than the French retreating from the Germans in World War II. Um, we're so desperate that we are now facilitating the movement of the Shia militias, including the Ba'ath militia, and the Iranians who are on the ground through Sunni territory in hopes that they will kill some ISIS people for us. That is not a recipe to suggest that the second pillar is going to work. In fact, both of these pillars are going to fail as significantly, as spectacularly as they did the last time. It's the same strategy, but we're doing it again. Now, the definition of mental illness, you know this one, right? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results each time. Um, perhaps a better definition for our purposes here <coughs> would be that if at first you don't succeed, just do it again, but spend more money and put more lives at jeopardy in hopes that something different will happen. I will say to you that I am so certain that it will not work that when we reprint this for the next edition, I'm changing the title to I told you so instead of we meant well. We're here at the War College, so I have to have a, I was told, I'm sorry, sir, I was told I had to include a Clausewitz uh, quote. Is that how you say it? Cla Clausewitz? Yeah, okay, I have to do the right German thing. I mean, my name is, is, is von Buren, but I still, I don't know a lot of German. Um, it, quick aside, I'm actually, uh, my family is actually from Holland. We're, we're, we're historically Dutch. And uh, the Dutch TV has always been very interesting because the Dutch in the early parts of the war sent soldiers. And every time they go, do you speak Dutch? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Oh, you must speak a little Dutch. No, I don't. I don't speak German either. So anyway, Clausewitz said that war is, it's colloquially translated as war is the continuation of policy by other means. Right? Well, what happens if there is no policy to begin with? What's the point of war if there is no policy? Creating the strategy while you're dropping the bombs tends to not work out. I want to quote from a, a very uh, brilliant man, a former, uh, actually former ambassador, who said, following on Clausewitz, war is an extension of policy by other means. But if the policy is coherent, the use of force to further it will be purposeless. Military action in support of it will be feckless. And the results it produces will be contradictory. Bombing first and developing a strategy later does not work. And repeating the strategy is only going to result in repeating the mistakes. And that does little but sacrifice much more at greater cost in absolutely every definition of that word. After what happened over nine years, hundreds of thousands of troops, billions if not trillions of dollars didn't work, it seems unlikely that repeating all that again based on exactly the same plan is going to succeed where the other one failed. And I stand here with all the, the, the jokes that I've, I've tried to, uh, to work into it and uh, pushing aside my own uh, struggles with this, deeply, deeply concerned. I had not served in the military. And my first real exposure to what happens to soldiers in the field 
came through this experience. I was embedded um, with uh, three different units, uh, a brigade with the 82nd Airborne, a brigade of the 10th Mountain Division, and a, a brigade from the 3rd uh, Infantry Division because of the difference in the way the rotations occurred. And so I spent the whole year uh, in the field, um, and I did what soldiers did. Um, we got, I counted, um, I got mortared, we got mortared 72 times. Um, I got shot at once that I was aware of um, in the field. And we lost three soldiers' lives during the year I was there. All three took their own lives, suicide. And I don't pretend to know what it is like to be a soldier, but I feel a personal pain when I see us committing those lives again into a situation where I can't find a discernible strategy. I can't see what the point is. I can't tell where it's going to end, other than I'm afraid more escalation and more lives. And so if I want to sound trite, I'll say, yeah, it's personal this time. And uh, I remain skeptical that our leadership is now doing in Iraq what is in the best interests of all of us, and specifically in the best interests of the men and women who are going to be asked to go back there. I want to thank you for this opportunity. As you could tell, my own employer, the Department of State, is not very interested in learning contrary uh, opinions and listening to what other people have to say. Um, the Army is, and when senior leaders tell me the Army is a learning institution, I can see that. I've had the opportunity to talk to a number of uh, military audiences. Um, I've been out to uh, Fort Leavenworth and the Command and Staff College there. Um, I had a chance to talk to some Special Forces people who may or may not be heading out to a uh, part of the world I'm familiar with, um, some National Guard units. And the fact that not everyone agrees with me is great. I, I don't want you all to agree with me. That's only my wife's job. What I want <laughs> is, what I'm very proud of the Army is that the Army is willing to listen to me as you have been tonight. We've got time for questions, and I'd be happy to try to answer any of them that I could. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a few minutes for questions. I will ask you to please keep yourself to one question, and please make sure it is a question. We appreciate that. Uh, Sarah and I will come around with uh, the microphones. We are recording this tonight, so please speak loudly, clearly, and into the microphone. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I appreciate your... I'm over here. Oh, hey, hello. <laughs> um, as speaking for the American people, as I often do, uh, I'm non-military, just a regular citizen. Is it possible that we are as completely incompetent as you've suggested? I mean, I'm just completely... I, I, I'm serious. I am nonplussed about this. I can only answer from my own perspective, from what I saw and experienced, and since then what I've uh, tried to educate myself on in saying I haven't seen competence, not on, not on a broad level. I've seen a lot of good people trying to do the best they can in difficult situations. I've seen a lot of folks scattered throughout the bureaucracy trying to push ideas in different up and across, but I am embarrassed to say that I have not seen in my in the State Department senior leadership as much competence as I'd like. Um, I can only judge from, from the media what happens on other places. The White House keeps turning down my, uh, my calls. But I can ask you to say, to ask yourself a question. Judge, judge, but judge them by their acts. Come to your conclusion. I mean, only me and General Bolger have admitted incompetence, but we'll... I've always wondered if, do you think our leadership understands at all how much these people hate each other? Um, I mean, I don't know how far up the line you have to go for leadership. Oh, okay. Um, it's, I, I promised myself that I would... Um, that I have forgotten the names of all the, the senior military people that I interacted with in Iraq. 
And so um, if you were going to ask me which, which colonel did the good job, and I've simply forgotten their names. But there was a, a, a general, really tall guy, head like a cue ball, um, who showed up everywhere, all over Iraq. And, you know, I was stunned by things that he would say in small groups versus things that he would say in, in the press, assuming they were reported accurately. And every time I heard him speak to smaller groups, particularly his officers, I got invited to all the meetings. It was like, bring your State Department guy to work day, because you know we were all supposed to be interagency playing nicely, and so it would look really bad if a, if a, if a VIP would come and you know, the one State Department guy for the whole brigade is not there. So I was always, you know, at, the, at these meetings. And it was fascinating for me because it was a thing that I normally was not. And, and, man, this guy knew. He knew. He really knew. I got an education every time I, I heard him speak. He knew exactly what was going on. He could talk about tribal leaders by name. He could talk about broader trends. He absolutely knew. The, the colonels that I interacted with knew. I, I never really talked to anybody beyond those levels. So people knew, but I cannot answer for you why that information, if it did go up, why it wasn't thought through. Th there's this odd sense I get, and I'm changing perspectives on you, just speaking as a, as a whatever I am now. We'll, we'll, we'll say a journalist for lack of a better. I either say I'm a journalist, retired, or unemployed, but they're all kind of the same. Um, you know, I, I truly don't understand how this very basic information. I mean, if I figured out that the Sunnis and ISIS are together for a particular reason, if I figured out that Prime Minister Abadi is appointing the same militia thugs to important positions, I don't know how come they didn't or haven't. I'll, I'll, they, it, it, it's, it's, I mean, hate is it, not... We, we, we had, you know, we, 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 one of our themes briefly was sports diplomacy. Um, one senior military leader had seen that, that movie Invictus. I don't know if you remember that, where the South African apartheid was solved because uh, the, uh, the black Africans played against the white South Africans. They played soccer and, you know, everything was... And he had seen that movie and because absolutely any insane idea was going to be funded, we actually held soccer matches where we tried to find a Sunni group to play soccer against the Shia group. Um, but we were very clever. We seeded some of our own guys onto both teams so we could make sure that these things tended to work out as a tie in most cases. That, I mean, they were, these, these are people who read their Clausewitz. There's no question. Um, the two groups really wanted very little to do with each other. I don't even know if hatred is, I mean, there's people who hate on both sides. They're the ones who, who set off car bombs and, and blow themselves up in markets. But I think, and it may sound kind of, kind of rainbows and unicorns, I think the majority of these folks really would just prefer to just go to their respective corners and leave each other alone to a certain degree. And if, uh, if somebody's going to ask the question about, well, what should we do? Is anyone planning to ask that? Okay, here's one, two, three, four. Um, yeah, the short answer is I don't know, or I'd be running for something. The longer answer is, is that like in former Yugoslavia, like in some other parts of the world, the reality is what it is. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Iraq has been, is, and will be a divided country. And we should devote ourselves, my humble opinion, to managing that process. Call it federalism, whatever nice word sounds, sounds right. I mean, Joe Biden suggested this back in 2006, but at that time, politically, it really wasn't given a hearing. Um, imagine, if you will, that instead of maintaining the fantasy of a unified government, the United States accepted that there was a big chunk of Iraq that was primarily Sunni. The Kurds are playing their own game. They've, they've got this, that there's a Kurdistan <clears throat> and there's a Shia area. The one thing that needs to be kind of managed is A, to keep these folks from killing each other, and that's a matter of physical separation, and the other is the oil revenues, which is what everybody needs is the money to, to eat. Um, if you devoted yourselves to managing those problems instead of trying to insist that the tide did not come in twice a day, 
that would give us something to work toward. That would give us a definable goal. Um, and maybe, maybe something realistic enough that I won't be back here in a couple of years talking about Iraq War 4.0. Yes, sir. Or, I'm sorry, the, 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 these guys got to control the traffic here for me. I just work here. You d described uh, kind of frighteningly a very bewildering scene when you first arrived, yeah. not knowing where to turn for answers and whatnot. Did any of your predecessors, good, bad, and indifferent, leave any documentation behind in the way of sort of an assessment or an after-action report no. that you go by? No. Um, some of this is, is, to be fair, sort of the way the State Department works. Um, we're not big on like record keeping, lessons learned. There's, there's no sort of State Department historian who travels around gathering things. I mean, the State Department historian right now is working on the, the Truman administration paperwork. So part of it is that. Part of it is that, like the, the military, we were only there for a year. Unlike the military, we got a couple of R&Rs in the middle to go off and, and, you know, violate all Ten Commandments in Dubai over one weekend. And so there wasn't record keeping. I had no idea what had been done before I arrived at, at, at Bob Hammer. I beg your pardon? Yes, it was. Because, you, you know, if you don't know what happened, it was, again, it was only through a few late night conversations that I learned that my predecessor had been thrown out by the colonel because he was so hard to get along with and that his predecessor had been psychovac and that his predecessor had waved his reserve officer's card around to the point where no one would you know there was no history to it we we everyone had their own year of war one year at a time they, I, I had this one of the very first military terms I learned was rip Right? This is Riptoa. This is when, you know, when one unit replaces the other unit. And they have this like two-week overlap or even longer where the new unit and the old unit work side by side and they slowly transition. And the thing is, I was laughing because the military guys say, well, two weeks is really not enough. And, and, you know, it's like I had no transition. There was nothing that followed me in or followed me out. And that was a huge part of the problem at the State Department. But, again, to be somewhat fair, that it was not unique to the State Department in Iraq. It just was more acute in Iraq, given how much was at stake and how complicated thing, things actually were. It's a matter of a couple questions. Um, what do you see as the end game in our involvement in Iraq? Uh, 20 years down the road, if everything goes the way we would like it to go, what difference will we have made? And it appears, at least to me, that we're not accomplishing anything and spending tons of money there. And should we be there at this point? All true. Next question, then, please. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, we go back to, we go back to and I'm not just beating Clausewitz because it's the one guy other than Sun Tzu that I actually know who knows the. Actually, Sun Tzu said, tactics without strategy is the noise of defeat, or something along those lines. So, I mean, that's the second military philosopher, and that's as far as I... Look, I mean, how will it go? What will we achieve? All these questions all presume that there's a, there's some, a goal that can be articulated. I mean, simply saying, what, there's the three Ds, right? Degrade, disgrace, destroy, demonize, whatever the three Ds are that we're doing to ISIS. I mean, that's as far as we've gotten in terms of a strategy. Don't even ask me about Syria, where the strategy is to support Assad while we're overthrowing, you know. I mean, it, it, if you don't know where you're going, uh, you can't really tell when you've gotten there, right? And, and so asking me to predict the future of Iraq demands that, that we have some, some point that I can say we're either going to reach or not going to reach. Um, but since you're a friendly audience, I mean, I think there, there's, there's, you know, three real possibilities, at least, you know, in, in the, the medium term. I mean, the near term is, is that enough bombs are, are going to create something of, of a stalemate. They're going to freeze everybody where, where they are. Um, we all know, this is one of your basic lessons, right? Air power can't hold territory, but air power can deny territory. So you've got this kind of frozenness that can be maintained for a fairly long time. Um, but I think one of three things is going to happen. One is that 
the devolution of Iraq is going to occur on its own. And it will be bloody, it will be messy, it will be horrible. The, the Sunni Shia thing will happen in one form or another. ISIS will play a role, Iran will play a role, and it will be a terrible mess. It will look a lot like 2005, maybe worse, because now you have a lot more proxies, uh, fight, proxies involved in this. The Iranians in particular are playing some. So that's one. The second possibility um, is that the, the Shias, with the Iranian support um, and with the tacit American support, will do what they may be looking to do all along, which is to basically marginalize the Sunnis to the point where they don't really exist in their country. Um, if you want to throw the word genocide around, there's a good place to do it. I think the third possibility, and as I alluded to at the end of my talk, the one that scares me, is that the United States will continue to escalate its role in Iraq. Because think about it. On August 1st, there were, there were no soldiers. There were, I mean, we had a couple, of, there were a couple of soldiers at the embassy doing, you know, liaison things. There was no air power being deployed. There were no Apache helicopters at Baghdad International Airport. There were no special forces. I guess they keep one foot off the ground so there's no boots on the ground. You know, there, none of that was there on August 1st. Now here we are, four months later, we've got an acknowledged 3,000 soldiers there. They're setting up, you know, brigade-level coordination, things like that. Apache helicopters are based at Baghdad Airport and flying combat missions. Stories in the media suggest that there are semi-permanent uh, air facilities being created in uh, Kirkuk, where American planes are flying out of. Suddenly, all this has happened in only four months. I worry that the most likely scenario for the near term is a continued escalation. Pick, pick the scenario you want. Um, imagine a terrible situation where an American soldier is, is beheaded in these terrible videos that ISIS puts out. The pressure on the president to do something at that point will be undeniable. It will have to result in an escalation that will be very hard to, to pull back from. And I'm afraid that that is the most likely scenario I, I see. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Tom Hendricks to make a very quick presentation. First, first a disclaimer. I said nothing about Clausewitz. No, 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 Peter no, no. I was just dinner. picking on you. I, I did talk about the uh, exercise of uh, strategic leadership and the employment of the global application of land power, which are near and dear to the mission of the War College. But I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Van Buren, for a provocative, personal, and yet uh, uh, insightful, if disquieting, uh, presentation. We appreciate that. Um, at this time, I'm going to make a brief presentation. I'd like to, to highlight uh, a slight change in uh, the sponsorship of the Perspectives in Military History lecture series. Now reverted back to the Military History Institute, uh, back to its origins, uh, thanks to the support of the Matthew B. Ridgway, Mary K. Ridgway, and Matthew B. Ridgway Family Endowment. So without further ado, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we very much appreciate your, uh, your presence here, and thank you all for attending. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.